at least four screws above, four below, and I don't need to put them right next to the fracture. I can spread them out a little bit. And, and the nice thing about ankylosing spondylitis is we can spread them out as much as we want. We can use six screws above, six below. Typically what I'll do is I'll put a set of screws right next to the fracture, then I'll skip a level or two and put another set of screws. And so really what I want is I want to have long lever arms. And in orthopedics, an external fixer becomes stronger if we put the screws near the fracture and then far away. And so basically that's what we're going to do. We're just going to create a long concept. So I've put, I've already put six of the screws in, and so I'm going to show you our workflow flow for putting screws in, but we're going to put the last screw in with workflow. And I have an example. I have one that's a little medial that I want to show you. So typically what I will do is I'll lay a metallic object and I'll get an AP image picture. Okay, and so you can see I have my screws above and uh, I'll, I'll adjust this down a little picture and I'll, I'll get a true AP. So I'll, I'll use my tilt to get my end plates lined up, which we've already done. And then once I have that, I'll mark the skin with a marker. I, I like to start my holes. I, I want to minimize my fluoro so I don't make a lot of pictures. Some people will mark it longitudinally, mark their pedicle. Do you have a knife? And uh, I don't do that. I, it, it, for me, I want to minimize my, my radiation exposure. So I'll get just what I need. So I'll use my fingers. I'll feel the spinous process between my fingers. Usually it's about two finger breaths out in the lumbar. We've learned from this patient it's about one and a half finger breaths out. And I'll make stab holes, just two stabs. These jam sheeties are, the long, are long ones. I normally use a shorter one, but these will work. They're a little unwieldy. And I, I always try to keep my hands out of the radiation as much as possible. So I'll, I'll just go down, touch bone, and then take an AP. And this will get me in the ballpark, and I'll begin to make adjustments. On, the, on my side, I'm going to try to hit, I'm going to try to hit 3 o'clock, and Andrew's going to hit 9 o'clock. So Andrew's almost perfect there. Picture. If you have navigation, this can be done nicely under some of the navigation systems. So I'm at 9 o'clock. So I want to start there, and I'll, I'll, a lot of times I can put it in by hand to start it. Go ahead and give that a couple taps. Or I'll just give it a quick couple quick taps. Good. And all I want to do right now is set it in the bone. Did, are you, picture. Let's see that a second. Move that one a little lateral. We'll just move that one a little lateral. Let's see. Picture. Again. A lot of times as you're feeling a patient's anatomy, particularly a thoracic spine, picture. I can feel I'm up, picture there. I can feel I'm up on top of the transverse process and I'll drop in a little, picture. Sometimes it's hard to keep it from sliding when that's the situation. Go ahead and tap it in and let's see what it looks like. So, oh, it slid, hold on. Let me try it one more time here, picture. Okay, that's not bad, go ahead. So we'll tap them in. And we'll get them just so they'll stay in the bone. Oop, give it. Let's see if that'll stay. Picture. Ah, let's try it one more time. Hold on. Picture. Okay, try it right there. That feels better. Picture. A lot of times you can feel it drop into the pedicle and you can feel good. So if you see here, we've got two, two that are started. Mine might be heading a little more medial, but when I've got it just into the bone, uh, I can make adjustments. And I'll try to work off the AP most of the time. So once I've got it in the bone and I can see Andrews, if you can look here, I'll use my finger because I want about a centimeter or so for it to go in and I'll just mark the pin, and I'll stay in out. Go ahead and move north a second so we can tap it in. Go ahead. That's good. Stop right there. Come down. And so I'll put it in about halfway to my mark. Picture. And you can see I've still not hit the medial border uh, on the fluoro. 
If I cross that medial border, can we, uh, is, is it possible to see up on the fluoro? Let me see a marker. So right now what I've got, if we can focus on the lumbar spine here, put one right there. Can you see that? So as I'm working my cannulas into the bone, I'm going to see the tip of this move lateral to medial because I'm, I'm, I'm converging as I go into the vertebral body. And so I don't want to see that tip cross this medial border until on the lateral I've reached the back of the body. So if I'm coming in this way, once I hit the back of the body, if I've not crossed the medial border, I know I'm safe within the angle of the pedicle. I know I'm safe in here. So three o'clock, nine o'clock starting. Spot. Three o'clock, nine o'clock, and I'll I'll converge them. So you can see Andrews is working its way across. We've double checked it again. Go back north, and so I'll stay in the AP and I'll go down to the mark that I made outside the skin. Can you step back a little bit on the video? Bottom? Okay. Yeah. And so mine, if you look at, I, I I'm a little concerned about the one on my side because I'm already into the middle of the body and I've barely gone in. So I'm going to make an adjustment picture. And how big are those K-wires? How much adjustment? This is just a jam sheety needle so far. So how many millimeters is that? Two millimeters? Two uh, probably Very. two to three. All right. Okay, picture there. All right, so I'm going to hold it up. I'm, I'm not going to go as medial. Go ahead, go north and we'll tap it in a little. Good. Come down and show it to me. So what I did is I didn't converge as much. Okay, so see I'm still there. And go ahead, tap it in a little further. I've not crossed the midpoint. I'm going to show you what it looks like when we cross the midpoint. Because we did that on one of the screws that was already in there. Good. Come down. Picture. All right. So you can see I've not crossed the medial border of the pedicle. So I'll go left to right with that image. Move that image left to right. So I can still look at it and come to the lateral now. So based on my estimates, I should have the tips of these roughly at the back of the vertebral body or just inside the body. And if that's the case, I'm very safe. So I'll wait till now to go to the lateral um, to, again, just to minimize to, for a better workflow and to minimize how much floor do I get. Come on in and, okay, let's see what that shows. I. I think it should be good. We were getting it before pretty good. Yeah. Uh, we're, we got something blocking it. Lower the sea arm or raise the table? Yeah, to raise the table. Go ahead and raise it a hair. Not sure why. Okay, that's good. Okay. Go ahead. There you go. Okay, so if you look, those are in the back of the vertebral body. So if I want, go ahead and tap them a little more. I can tap them in just a bit further. Good. And this one. And I'm pretty safe. So I know those are not broaching the medial canal. I'll stay in lateral now and I'll put my guide wires in. Usually I can push them in. But sometimes if, I, if they're a little bit stubborn, I'll grab them with a bulldog or heavy needle driver and tap them in like that. Andrew, being a neurosurgeon, he couldn't get that too thing dainty. unsqueed. It was, he was too dainty, so we had to bring one of the guys in to unscrew that for him. Picture. <laughs> All right, you can see both my wires are in, and I'll back the jam sheeties out now. Again, it's, it's a little tough with these long ones, but we'll wiggle them loose and back it out, maintain that position. This is one of the places where you can run into problems because uh, you can lose your wire. Okay, picture. You can see both our wires in a place. So initially, I only make a stab hole. And the reason I only make a small stab is because if I have to adjust my starting site, I don't want to feel obliged to use that hole. I like to be able to make another hole. I don't want this big meandering incision. So once I've got my screw in it, I'm happy. I'll widen my hole down through the fascia enough to accommodate the screw. Depending on what system you're using, 
uh, I'll either use a tap or no tap. In this particular system, I don't have to use a tap. And so we'll put our screws in. And usually you can, based on what you know already, you can select the screw length. We're actually out of the shorter screws, so these are, the, these are 50s. But I'll back them in. And just like doing a hip fracture, as we go in, picture, I'll periodically check to make sure I'm not advancing the wire, that it's not binding up in the screw and advancing through the anterior part of the vertebral body. Picture there. All right, as we get close to fully seated, we'll back out our, uh, our K wires before they get jammed up. And if you look at our screws above, I want to get the depth of our screw to match the screw above, so that when I pass my rod, I'm not trying to change the depth of one vertebral body relative to the one below. Picture. Put them in just a bit more. Picture. If you jam them in too hard, if you put them too deep, you'll block the tulip head from going. So you don't want them bound too deep, and then we'll go ahead and we'll take that out. And so now if we go north, so you can see we've got screw, we skip the body, picture. We've got two screws. We're going to assume the fracture is between those two and go north. Picture. And we have one more set of screws. Go to the AP because I'm going to show you. I have one screw that's a little bit medial. It's that one. This one? Yeah. So roll it to the AP. Now this screw's all the way in, so it's hard to tell. If you have the screw deep into the vertebral body, it can actually look, look like it's medial to pedicle. But this screw, I will tell you, is medial because when we put it in, we could see it passing medial. Go north, north. Picture. All right, if you take a look at the, 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 the screw on the right side of the screen, that, that one started out about the middle of the pedicle and it crossed the medial border before it was all the way through the pedicle, before it hit the back body. And I can guarantee that one's in the canal. So that's what it'll look like. You can see the others, despite being deep into the body, are either right at the medial border of the pedicle or just medial to it. Those other screws are all very safe. The other screws look perfect. John, let me ask you a question. Yeah. So Neurostem, Motors, what do you do for these cases? I, uh, I use I use SSEP and motor monitoring for all of them. Can you stimulate those screws? Have you done that? Uh, I don't stimulate the screws. I, you know, here's the problem I have with screw stimulation is it's very sensitive. And I've seen people that do it. I had a partner that always did it, and he was always taking out screws and changing them. And every time we run a screw in and out of a pedicle, we lose the, some strength to that screw. And if we do it twice, we probably ought not to even bother putting it in. And he was doing it all the time. And he would say, I would look at his thing, and I would say, why'd you leave out all those screws? All oh, they stemmed wrong. And I said, so, you know, how much you want to bet if I stemmed my screws, you'd have said I have to leave them out, and I've never left any out, and I don't have those problems. And so I think it's overly sensitive, and it causes us to do things that we don't need to do and, and weaken our constructs. So I think it can be a useful tool, but I don't do it for that reason. So once I have those in, then we'll do our rod pass. And again, I intentionally don't make my holes any bigger than I need to until I'm ready. And so at this point, I don't know that it matters whether you pass caudal to cephalad or cephalad to caudal. I usually look at the patient and see what I think is going to work the best. And if you have an ankylosing spondylitis patient, you really want to try to contour your rod to match their kyphosis. And some of them are very hyperkyphotic. That can be very challenging. Uh, if in a kyphotic spine, if in an ankylosed spine, you don't match their kyphosis just right, what will happen is you'll try to pull screws up to a rod. And because there's no motion between the vertebrae, you'll rip the screw out. If you have a mobile spine, you can, you, it, you don't, it doesn't have to be as critical because the spine will adjust to the rod. In an ankylosed spine, it won't do that. So most of the time, uh, if I don't think it's matching, I'll pull my rod back out and re-bend it. Selecting rod length is also difficult because 
if you're in the thoracic spine, I can kind of lay my rod up against my screws and get a sense of rod length. Because these are coming out in a divergent fashion, by the time I get down to the spine, even though that looks like it matches, my rod will probably be a little long. I'm okay with that in an ankylosed spine because it doesn't move above or below. If I'm in the lumbar spine, because my screws come out convergent, if I match, match them at skin level, then the rod's going to be too short. And so in a thoracic spine, I'll kind of make it a little tight, maybe a little, look a little short on the skin. In the lumbar spine, I'll make it look a little long on the skin. And then when I pass the rod, in this particular system, I pass it through the same skin hole. And I'll work it. Once I'm in my first hole, I hold the second one, and I can pass, and I can feel my rod hitting the screw. And by using my hand on that screw, and my right hand on the rod, left hand on the screw, I get, a, I get almost a uh, triangulation like you would get to an arthroscopy, that I can get a sense of where the tip of that rod is. And once I pass it in this skinny cadaver, I can see my rod through the screw. If I can, great. In a good, fat, nice size West Virginia, you can't do that. So I drop this down once I think I'm through. And if I move my rod up and down, you can see how it moves the, moves the black tool up and down. If I'm not in the screw and I move my rod, you can see the black thing doesn't move. So I'll put it in, verify it's through one, and then I'll grab a hold of the next screw. Same thing, I can feel it. And go ahead and check that one. And uh, again, you can see I'm through. And then I'll work it to the next one, again, just feeling it. Let's check that one, I don't think that's through. Okay, so that one's not through. Okay, so picture there. So I'll take a picture here, and I'll check, and you can see my rods up to the screw. That means I'm either a little medial or lateral. The nice thing is I have a curve to my rod, and I can match it. And like right now, because I have my left hand on the screw, I can feel myself hitting the screw. I can feel myself going through, I can, and I can feel that it stabilized the screw. So I'm pretty sure I'm in. Similarly, I can move it up and down, and I can see that moving, and I'm in. And so I'll drop my rod in all the way. The other thing I would tell you is you want to make sure your rod, as you put it in, is deep to the fascia. If it's not deep to the fascia, you'll, as you put your screw in, the fascia will pucker. It'll pull the fascia down into the wound, and it makes it much more difficult. So when you initially put it in, you want to be deep to the fascia. And if you look, come, come to the top here. Go to the top. So I'll verify that I have my rod all the way through at the top. And I do. I probably could give it a little more room, picture. So I'm safe. Come to the bottom, picture. And I'm safe there. So I should be pretty good. As that squeezes down, there'll be more room for the rod. And it doesn't matter which side I start on. It also looks like my contour is going to be pretty good. So I'll start squeezing the rod down. Go ahead, North. How much manipulation room do you have now at this point in time? Is there still room for distraction or compression? Yes. You could, you, there are all, these, all these MIS systems have their distraction compression devices, and we can do a little distraction or compression. Uh, you, you need to set a lever point outside the skin. If, otherwise, you're just going to hit your two things together. You don't affect the screws. So you have to put something between these cannulas that blocks it so that the compression and distraction is felt by the screw. If you don't have something there, these hit, and all you do is, is connect your, your uh, insertion devices. Go ahead and do this one. And so what we'll do is as this goes in, it looks like our contour matches pretty well. If I have an ankylosed spine and I'm not seeing the rod sitting up too high at the caudal end, I'll, I'll, I'll back it out and redo the rod bend, because I will tell you, you'll break your screws out. Come on south, picture, go north a little, picture. So you see, we're already seated in those screws. So if this was an ankylo spine, I would, I would be good to go, and I would finish putting each of my screws in. Do you have the uh, compression distraction thing? And then I'll show you a compression distraction technique, and then we'll be done. With my right hand, I'm holding my 
my kyphosis in the proper direction so I stay aligned. And we'll tighten down each of the screws. And then once that one goes in, I can release the rod and, and I can torque counter torque. So in this system, if I want to do any compression or distraction, well, those are tight. All the systems, again, I mean, this is just how this system works, but all the systems are a little different. Knife, you have the knife. I'll show you what I mean to, to do compression and distraction. I just got to make these holes a hair bigger. I try to keep my holes pretty small. If I'm doing MIS, I don't want to make holes any bigger than I really need to. Okay, and so what happens is this one comes with a, a, a device where I can pop this thing on the top and this will keep those from coming together. The other way to do that, do we have a cob? Let me see a cob. The other way to do that is, is to take a cob or something out here behind where we're going to compress and then, then we can hold it apart that way. And so you, we would compress on the outside like that. That's how a lot of systems work. This particular system, it sort of does it for you, and then it puts the, uh, you know, the compression distraction device out here, and then, and then, rather than get the compression between the ends of the cannulas, it puts it down onto the screws. So you have to have something that blocks these from coming together. Depends on what system you're using. And then you could put your, you could put your cap down. Your, let me see the, screw, the cap thing without a cap. So right now we have a cap in here. So if I was going to do this, I could loosen the cap, compress, tighten my cap down. And then we're done. Any questions? Yeah, I have one. So for angst bond fractures, what I've frequently seen is that there's some loose debris, ligamentum flavum, or ossified ligamentum flavum, yeah. lamina fractures, epidural hematoma. Do you do a small takedown of that fracture zone, or what do you do with that? Not typically for an acute one. I know exactly what you're talking about. It'll fold in there. If I have one that comes to me, and it's a week or so old, and I don't think that stuff's going to be mobile, it's going to be starting to get stuck, I'll make a little mini incision in the midline and go in and clear that out. I've done that a few times uh, before I compress anything down or reduce it. So I'll have a, an extra incision right at the midline, only at the fracture, and do a little mini clean out. I don't do that routinely for my ang spawns if I fix them acutely. They fracture and I put them on a the schedule the next day and fix them. Now I'm going to open up a can of worms with this one, but I'll ask you one more troubleshooting question. Yeah. So let's just say you had that one screw that was medial. Yes. And you've shot your motors and they've dropped uh, yes. bilaterally. So just run us quickly through a sequence of what would you do to troubleshoot that? Well, if I drop my motors, to be honest with you, I would probably open the patient and do them open. I probably wouldn't play around anymore with the MIS because uh, I think we're more accurate open. Um, you know, if I had intra-op nav or an O-arm, I might, or, you know, an intra-op CT, I might roll a thing and take a look at it. Uh, I probably would open that screw and put it in in an open fashion. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Any other questions from the audience? Did a really nice job that, uh, with that demonstration. I, I, it's very impressive to me, as I said earlier to the audience, um, how you've converted uh, to a selective MIS surgeon because yeah. I always held you up as a traditional open surgeon and uh, so it's uh, yeah. impressive to see you having converted. Make, make no mistake about it, Jens. I'm still very leery of it, but I think it has a role and I think what we need to do is say what are the good things and take those and apply it to the right patient. You know, what bothers me is when I see people and they say I'm an MIS surgeon and they apply MIS to everything they're doing. I don't, first of all, I don't think the pathology is amenable to that. I think there's a lot of people doing a bad job with MIS. I think there are guys doing unbelievably good jobs with it. We just have to figure out where it is and get through the learning curve. And I'd say in the beginning, stick to the stuff that it really seems to be ideal for. The good, like in trauma, I would do angst spawn. I mean, it's perfect for ankylosing spondylitis. You just have to be careful with your rod contour. Now, yesterday you gave us a, a very impressive case demonstration of a young girl that had basically yeah. broken most the thoracic vertebra and had a severe lumbar burst fracture. Yeah. You did a selective fusion at the bottom. 
Yes. And can you explain what you did then with that uh, uh, rod attachment to basically then remove the um, MIS part so of your construct later? In that patient, I would have had something like this at the top, and then at the bottom, I would have had an open wound in my regular screws. And most people's MIS system, they have an open system that's compatible with it. And so I would use their open system in the open area, their MIS at the top. And there's two ways to do it. In that particular patient, uh, I just passed one rod. I made the rod my contour. I put it in through the open wound, passed it up through my percutaneous part. The other way to do it is to pass a rod through the MIS and use a rod in your open and then a rod to rod connector. So then when you, if I was gonna remobilize the upper part of my spine, I either need to do one of two things. I either need to make an incision down and get a big ass bolt cutter in there and cut the rod. That could be a pain in the neck because to get the, the ends of those bolt cutters down into the wound requires a lot of room. And so easier is probably to do an end to end connector and then all I got to do is make a little incision, unscrew the, the rods, and I can just slide the rod out with the connector. And so that's probably the easier way to do it is to make one long rod but have the connector in the place where you're going to disconnect eventually. It's outstanding. Great tip. Um, so really, really good. Thank you very much, John and Andrew.